tabu kia fio ya otu wako. Fatabu kia waiki na maama la pule. Fatabu kia kaumatoa. Koe kaumatoa waiki fatahanga. Nanga tae tea fai kito mwa. Nanga tae fai mwa haki popo. It is uh, an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I didn't realize that this is a very big conference. <laughs> I use, I'm, I'm not usually nervous when I speak to a foreigner like this, but I am now. <laughs> and luckily my wife is not here. <laughs> so she's the biggest... Um, criticize of my talks, <laughs> so I'm free, okay? Um, I was asked to, to talk about my journey, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, Fonterra, who sponsored my trip. Fonterra sees what you are doing as something very important to our community, and they sponsored my trip as part of my work. And the people who organized the travel, they said, oh, we'll pay, we'll pay for you to come and so forth, and I said, well, for terrible pay to life. So, what you're doing is very important. Um, I am going to give you a bit of a philosophical approach to build a platform for my story, and then, uh, well, hopefully, it's, you can understand me better. You may notice that um, I have an accent according to my children. <laughs> they, they call me Forbes. <laughs> and I was not quite sure what Forbes is, but I suspect it's something not very nice. <laughs> a, um, a group of six-year-olds uh, um, Sunday school was asked, were asked by the teacher to write a letter to God. And one kid wrote this, Dear God, I went to this wedding and those two were kissing right there at church. Is that okay? <laughs> one boy wrote this, Hey God, it must be very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There's only four people in my family. <laughs> One boy wrote a letter to God and sent it in the mail. And the postman picked up the letter and it addressed to Almighty God and he didn't know what to do with it, so he opened it. And it read something like this. Dear God, I am six years old and my parents are separated and I'm living with an uncle who is poor. Please give me $200 so I can buy books and clothes for school. And the man felt sorry for the boy, so he attached twenty dollar note to the letter and passed it around the staff. And they collected some money, never got to two hundred dollars, and whatever they got, they sent it to the boy. And a week later, the man picked up another letter, Almighty God. He said, Oh, this must be thanking us for the money. So he opened the letter and it read, Dear God, thank you for the money, but please next time don't send it through the mail, the mail, the people in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> a class of six-year-old, six-year-olds grew up for lunch at school, and they came across a large bo box of apples with a note on it: "One apple only. Remember, God is watching." <laughs> And further down the table, there was a large tray of, of chocolate biscuits with, without a note. And the boy picked up a piece of paper quickly and wrote a note on it, saying, take as many as you like because God is watching you. <laughs> you can see the innocent heart of the people you are working with. And if there was a time to influence our children, then it is what you do. And may I comment you for what you're doing? 
change the future, you need to change the hearts of the next generation. And it is your job. I want to thank you for that. A uh, business manager was sitting in his office on the 24th floor of a tall tower in London. And he noticed that there are cracks on the wall, in the wall. So he went to an engineer, engineering firm and asked them to come and fix the problem. And after a week and a half, nobody turned up. So he went to them again. <coughs> I rang you a week and a half ago and we bought this problem and then nobody turns up. What is happening? He was told to go down to the third basement. There are people who have been working there since the day you rang. And he went down and found there are about 30 people working away with lots of tools, lots of steel, lot of equipment. And he went back to his, his office and thinking, there is something fundamentally wrong with the foundation of this building that caused the cracks on the 25th floor. And quite often we only see problems in the higher level. And quite often we don't really see the problems are actually in the foundation. And he thought to himself, that is a very interesting lesson to learn. Because quite often we try to patch up the cracks. Because if those engineers went to his office and patch up the and cover up the cracks on the wall, that didn't, wouldn't solve the problem. The problem would still be there. And I think what you were doing is important because the problem is in the foundation. When it comes to the Pacific Island people, um, the government has done so well. Excuse me, I need a bit of a drink. My kids told me that my my jokes are really dry. <laughs> and quite often, I see the government have a lot of records of statistics after statistics of how poor the Pacific Island people are doing in New Zealand. When it comes to education, when it comes to household income, when it comes to, to health, we are at the bottom of the heap. And they are very good in pointing out the cracks. But what's the solution? We need to go down to the foundation. And I ask the question to myself, what is the fundamental problems that cause all these cracks on the 24th floor? How, how are we going to solve the problems? And I ask the questions about my parenting role. Do we do it right? How about the family? Are the problems these people see coming from my family, from the way I do parenting? How about cultures? Do I display my culture in a way that is appropriate for the development of, my, of the next generation? How about Christianity? Do we hide underneath Christianity as a means of hiding away from the problem, shying away from the problems? And I ask a lot of questions about that. And, and there's a lot of questions that I have, and I I personally have a lot of arguments with anthropologists and sociologists who are actually tolerant in the Pacific. I am not a, an anthropologist, but I do challenge them. <coughs> See, I, I want to, to give you, if I get to be a bit more philosophical now, uh, to build a, a platform for my talk. I gave a, a lecture some years ago at the University of the School of Sociology and Human the School of Social Humanity and Social Work at Massey University. And I began the lecture by saying that the biggest need of a human being is one for dignity. Um, 
and dignity has got three components that need to be fulfilled. The first one, every person needs to have a strong sense of belonging. You need to belong to something. Every person needs to have a strong sense of worth. You need to know that you are important. And every person needs a strong sense of security. Whether you know it or not, if you are a parent, that is what you do. You unconsciously treat this little rascal to know that he or she belongs to you and everything in the house belongs to her. You spend all your time trying to teach her to know that on top of everything I do, you are top in my priority. Strong sense of worth. And you spend all your effort trying to teach that little rascal to understand that under my care, you are safe, you are secure. And everybody, all of you, everybody is born with that sense, that desire for dignity. So basically teaching is more than just giving you information. You think about the little kids that turn up before in your class. How does he or she feel? Teaching is building dignity in the hearts of the little rascals that come to your class. The second one is what I refer to as an apple seed principle. How many seeds are there in an apple? Who can tell us? Do we know? Ten? Twelve? Well, you may be interested to know that Christ sheds down, the average seed is only about four. And from Christ sheds up to around Wellington and one or two, it's five and a half. And from one or two up, it's seven. And then from Auckland upwards, it's close to twelve. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting because I made it up. <laughs> Who cares about how many seats you get? For goodness sake. See, the question that we need to ask is not how many seats in the apple. But how many apples are there in the seed? How many apples are there in the seed? You think about it. How many? See, it depends so much on what I do. Because if I take the seed and throw it into the rubbish, it may end up in a compost somewhere. That seed doesn't have an apple. But if I look after the seed, grow it, Fertilize the soil, keep the weeds out of it, keep the horses away. Probably in the first year I would have 17. And in the second year I would have 160. And from then on, I would have hundreds and hundreds. And if you look after that seed, you can produce millions of apples out of one seed. And I wonder if you see your child coming to your class that way. Do you see the potential in one child? See her as a seed. What is the potential? How many can I get from this little girl? And it depends on what I do. It depends on what I do at home. See, he can produce many apples out of that. Bob Gash said this, in the hearts of unpromising young people bearing seeds of greatness, these seeds can abruptly spring to life when they are recognized, watered, and nurtured by a good mentor like you. Isn't that true? Proverbs say, train, a, train up a child the way he should go. Even when he is old, he'll never depart from it. And that is pretty much philosophical. 
when you teach. See, teaching is building dignity in a child, and teaching is nurturing the natural potential in a child. Let me uh, take a bit of time. How am I doing the time? Almost time is start. <laughs> Let me make a note on culture. See, uh, for us who come from the island, I, am, uh, I, I migrated from Tonga to here. And, uh, and there is a lot of cultural issues in my life as a person and as a father. And uh, let me share a bit of my um, um, experience in this area with you. See, the, the accepted discourse when it comes to culture is that our behavior is dictated by our cultures. I wear this because I am a Maori, or I do this because I'm Muslim, or I do this because I'm Samoan or Tongan. So basically, culture begins behavior. Your behavior is forced on you by your culture. But you see, under that uh, notion, there are two assumptions that are very dangerous. Number one, the culture is always right and I'm always wrong. For example, if I do something that is different from the accepted norm of the culture, then I owe an apology to the rest of my community. When there is a big uh, church thing and everybody wears a tapal to church because that's the form of, of respect, and I turn up with my gene, I have to give an apology to the rest of the church because the assumption the culture is always right and I'm always wrong. It's not only that, but culture is static. It doesn't change. That assumption, that means when I move from Tonga to New Zealand, the culture stays the same. And when I move from here to the native, in the freezing cold, I have to wear to bend instead of a jean. And, and this is probably the fundamental problem in raising New Zealand-born Pacific generations because our parents would be people like me who give birth to, to kids in New Zealand have to do a lot of study and analysis of my role. Are these assumptions right? See, once upon a time, this guy came from Tonga to find a Balani wife. <laughs> Not long he discovered that the way he looks uh, basically pushed the Balani girls away. <laughs> and, uh, he basically ran into this young beautiful lady who also looked, looked for a Balani husband. <laughs> With a bit of uh, discussion, they realized they have the common problem, missing out on the Balangi spouse market. <laughs> With a quick agreement and the promise of riches in the future, they got married and then there were three. But you see, we are both Tongan born, strong Tongan cultural values, proud Tongan heritage, and we produced three young rascals that grew up in New Zealand, and they have different cultures and values. They're proud Tongan New Zealanders. How do you negotiate between the differences between different cultures? You see, in our home, there is context, context of cultures every day. And how do you deal with that? Because I think this is where the fundamental problems come from. See, my, uh, my understanding of my culture, I, I mean, born in Tonga, I work a lot with the Pacific communities. I have been uh, in a lot of committees and reference groups and boards that are Pacific. Uh, been advising the minister for about 13 years. I just stepped down last year. 
And understand, I, I, in my role in the community, I understand the, a lot of issues associated with our people. And I also, in many le leadership roles. So, my understanding of culture is based so much on my personal uh, journey. And when I watch the, the kids grow up, they have a culture of their own, very different from mine. And I have to give recognition for what they, they are, who they are as a people. For what I realize, there are lots of things that I try to teach them that are not appropriate at all. And, um, and they grow up and question almost everything I do. I went fishing. I got something like uh, 19 large kawais and got home. And then I split them up to something like six different uh, portions. I got the three for, to, for me and all this. And then my son, Dad, what, what are you doing? Oh, this is for Molly, this is for this, and this is for the Dad, you bought the net. You put petrol in the car. You went fishing. These guys are just drinking cover. Why on earth do you give them fish? See, culturally, that's what I do. That's what they're normal. But they grow up and question, why, why, why do you do that? We had a funeral just last week. My father-in-law came and uh, stayed. They came for Christmas, and they forgot to go back. <laughs> They love me to pieces. <laughs> but uh, when they came, uh, we noticed that uh, my father-in-law was not well. He started to talk, and things seemed to, to, he seemed to forget things. And he passed away uh, on the 16th of last month, and the funeral was last week. But in the process, he was a, he was a great man in Wellington, a great leader. But in the process, I was in charge of um, looking after the thick people who came. Okay. And you know that those donations from people, you know, more than $40,000, $40, people giving out money to help. And that's an awesome opportunity for me to, to show my kids, look, you always question my culture, and this is what happened. See, this money will pay for all our bills. <laughs> but you see, it's quite interesting. But you see, yeah, um, let me give you some examples of how we deal with culture, culture context of cultures in my own household. See, respect is big in uh, Maori, and Pacific, you know, any Pacific culture, respect is very important. And in the household, you always teach your children to obey, to respect you. But you see, the culture of my children, if you want respect, you have to respect your children. And most of the Pacific Island parents don't want to talk about respecting their children. You see, I learned it the hard way. I had my son growing up. Uh, he inherited a lot of good things from his mother. So he, uh, he was a captain uh, in the rugby team, and he was also a head boy in his school, small school. And then I went and watched him being treated by the teachers and the coach, coaches. And they're, hey, Sonic, come here. What do you think we should do about this? Do you think it should be OK? You know? And it's, Sonic, you know, can you think about how you, you, you can find some boys to do this? He is treated with much respect until he walks into our house. <laughs> we belittle him, tell him off for not putting the rugby shoes outside not tidying the room and all those of garbage. And I said to my wife, you know this guy? He's respected everywhere he goes until he walks into this house. What on earth are we doing? We go the guy, come, sit down, son, we need to apologize for you. The way we have raised you is so wrong. Nobody taught us how to be parents in a culture like this. From now on, you are men. And from that point on, we treated him as a man. Man, it made a lot of difference. But you see, 
If we want our New Zealand born children to respect us, we need to respect them first. Listen, you know, in our Pacific Islands, you see, even, even me, after getting married, the, our culture in the islands, we get together all the extended family, and regardless of, of where you get your PhD, we have all our say, and then the top man will make the call. And whether right or wrong, that's it. You don't have any say. So basically, the children always talk to learn, to listen to children. But in the culture of our New Zealand born children, I need to listen to them. Man, they tell me a lot of great things that are so wrong in my own as a father. And I thank God for that. It makes me a better father, it makes me a better husband. And it's very important to listen to your children. The time, quite often, because the need for dignity is the same for everyone. And quite often, parents come here and they run into communities to church and try to buy their sense of belonging by using their time and everything else, being raw mortal in the church but not at home. And parents basically drag the children with them to church or wherever the parents want to know. But the culture of my children, they want specific time and specific things for them. So it's important for us to figure out how to, to follow the children or organize things for the children. So dignity, time with the kids, you see, when we take them to the church, they kind of go like this. And when we take them fishing, they say, yes! It makes a lot of difference, right? And it's also emotional space. You see, the biggest problem with the Pacific Island kids are not really physical. They are not hungry. You don't find anybody that are committing suicide because of hungry or cold or anything. Physically, everything is fine. Kids commit suicide because they don't have a good sense of dignity. Once they lost the sense of belonging, a sense of value, suicide is an option. But you see, it's very important for us as parents to give the kids an emotional space to express themselves. I told a story of my youngest daughter. Um, she was nine. And I was, uh, on Saturday afternoon, I normally the cook of the house, and my wife loves the idea. <laughs> and um, on a Saturday afternoon, I was too lazy, and I said to my daughter, I'm going to buy a takeaway to the come. And she hopped in. And as we were driving to town, I looked at her, she, she was not herself, and I said, Wendy, are you okay? And she said, no, no. Yes, what's up? Oh, then you would understand. You know, of course I understand. What are you talking about? Oh, Dad, you wouldn't understand. You said, don't say that. What's going on? Dad, I'm in love. <laughs> Nine years old. <laughs> I picked up then that she inherited, inherited a lot of evil from her mother. <laughs> and I said, so do you want to talk to me about it? <coughs> oh, Dad, but you don't know the name of the guy. So I, because I know you, just tell, talk to me. It turns out that she fell in love with the guy in the movie. <laughs> she was just watch, watching a movie before we went to town, and she was taken away by love. And I said, oh, oh it's all right, your mother was like that. <laughs> she fell with everyone in the movie until I turned up. <laughs> and I said, you know, do you know the first time I fell in love with a lady? Yeah, yeah, Dad. What, what, when, when, when was that? I was five. Dad! <laughs> yes, I was five. And who was, was she pretty? Was she pretty? Well, she was actually my teacher. <laughs> she was probably 30 years older than I was. <laughs> but in my five-year-old eyes, she was pretty. And her dad. You know, from that point on, the love area is an open forum, open topic in my household. You know, for the Pacific Island fathers, no one is good enough for your daughters. 
So it's a taboo topic. Don't talk about it because no one is good enough. But you see, to provide them with good space for them to grow as normal girls, normal ladies, I tell you, it's sweet, absolute sweetness. So the conclusion of my comment on culture, see, culture does not begin behavior. It's actually reality. When you get to a situ new situation, you begin a new thing and you start a new culture. So culture is dynamic. It's not static. And culture, people are always right, not culture. <coughs> because quite often, we sacrifice people for our culture. I have seen kids in the church that is slapped on the face because he said something that culturally inappropriate. So we basically sacrifice our children for the sake of our culture. Not right. Okay? Then we can speak faster. I am uh, asked to talk about my journey. I grew up in a very small village in the island of Tonga, the village Mangia, an island of Abao. Uh, we were poor, 11 children. My dad uh, was uh, a fisherman and a gardener, and I loved going fishing, going gardening. I never liked education. And up to form four, which is uh, NC um, level 10, year 10, in our modern class classification, I, uh, I had to pass the first national exam, and it took me three years to finish that. And that's how smart I was. I remember the very first year, I was in Form 4E. The letter E denotes the academic capability and all the good students were in Form 4A and B. And at the end of the term, um, we, we, I was sitting in a large hall like this. There was uh, 1,800 students in the, in the whole school. And the price given went something like, uh, like this. You know, beginning from the poor guy at the bottom of the class. Eh? Number 32, uh, 32%. Basically, the name of the, the position, the name of the guy in the village he comes from, and the percentage average he achieved. And I listened very carefully to pick up where I was in my class. And then uh, I was surprised that he went past the number Fifth, I was I was the top five of the class, and eventually he said, second, Malatas Haver Mangir about 42.8 percent, and I felt so shame in front of the whole school. They knew I failed miserably, and I took the five mile walk home, thinking, what on earth am I going to say to my village? What on earth am I going to say to my parents? And when I got to the village, I was so surprised the news is already spread far and wide. Because <laughs> any news in my village will spread far and wide fast because they are very good at gossiping. <laughs> and then as I walk past the houses, they say, oh, Tasa, well done, well done. I walk past um, my uncle, he stood up and cried, Tasa, well done. And then when I got home, my parents had already sacrificed the only rooster we got to celebrate my bogus success. See, my village understood that I was second in the class, but they missed the fact that I was 42%. See, they only discovered that two years later, when I was still sitting in the same class, <laughs> attempting, <laughs> attempting for the third time to pass the same exam. So I moved from that school to another school and I was mixed around with Christians and they changed me. Not long I became one of them and things changed. I started to have a dream and in the first term I got something like 41% at form six. I basically lied to the teacher that I had passed my school certificate in the other school. And he looked at me in the innocent look that I am. He put me in Form 6 and everybody was speaking English. And, oh, okay. <laughs> and I had 41% average. And that was the highest average I ever achieved in Form 6. 
At uh, term two, <coughs> after term two, I was 60%. And then the final term, I got top in the class and I won prizes. First time ever to win prizes at school. <laughs> I worked four years and then uh, for four years before coming back to university, I got a scholarship to come to university. And when I got there, uh, I forgot everything I learned. <laughs> and I got picked up very quickly that this guy should be here. I was uh, classified as one of the dumbest guys in the class. I remember doing a, a computer uh, lab. You know, those times when the computer was new, it was a big computer, and it could only do the spreadsheet and stuff. And I never seen the thing before I came to New Zealand. And, and one professor, you know, we were supposed to use the spreadsheet to do an engineering um, project. And if you hadn't seen the computer, most likely you hadn't used spreadsheet. And this guy came along and said, you know, it's even started. It's very easy. You know, all you need to do is do this and do this and do that. Do you, do you understand? It took him two minutes to teach me everything about computer and everything about spreadsheet. And then at the end he said, do you understand? And then I, he shook his head and moved on. And he said to me, you know, every year we have people like you. <clears throat> and then moved on. The next morning I was given a little yellow uh, piece of paper. I said, you need to go and see the professor. And when I walked to the professor, he gave me a piece of paper. This guy does not have a clue about what he's doing here. He is not a technologist and he should not be here. I don't know how you feel about that. How would you feel if you told that? When I finished from university, I, uh, I got uh, four degrees, including a master of first class honors. And I got the top scholarship at the school. Uh, when I left, my professor was ask, asking me, um, Tasa, can you write a paper for me, please? Uh, yeah, what, what paper? Can you talk about your journey as a student? What made the transition to change from a below average student, failure student, to become the top honor student and the recipient of our top scholarships? And I said, why do you need a paper like that? You would be a good teaching tool for us. You know, every year we have people like you who come here, seemingly ignorant of what is going on, don't really understand much. And we don't have any solution for people like you. And our only solution is to encourage them to go away. But you proved us wrong. How many people like you we had already sent away? But the fact is, maybe we don't really know how to teach people like you. And that was sweet. That was sweet. I now work at Fonterra as a scientist, and I have the privilege of inventing a number of things that brings millions and millions of dollars to the New Zealand dairy industry. Um, I have enjoyed um, a lot. It's very academic. I have supervised a number of PhDs, probably five or six PhDs, and something like 24 masters. Over the years, I spent a lot of time marking theses, PhD theses, and papers written by people from all over the world for general publications. And so it's very academic, and I enjoy doing what I do. And, um, and I go around to community like this and tell my story. And then, with this conference, it's quite a pleasure to stand here as a proud Tonga and talk about my own journey. Now, I want to give you a few points because my time is running out. I better talk fast. The first one, you need to understand the local status of your calling. I don't really know how you go end up with the job you do. I don't really know. But do you notice that that is a calling? The influence you make on the next generation, don't underestimate it. <coughs> See, I uh, spent some time with uh, Professor Nico Pesnia, who is uh, the Dean of Anthropology in the University of Amsterdam. And we spent weekend in his home talking anthropology. He writes a lot about Pacific people. And what he said, the most important part of the entire curriculum 
is what we teach at early childhood level. I am not saying this just to make you feel good, but realistically, realistically, if there is a job that is highly underpaid in all the countries, including New Zealand, then it is your job. Because you build the foundation for our kids in the future. And I want you to challenge you to see your job as the most important job, the most important in the lives of the little rascal that is sitting before you. See them as apple seed. What can come out of this little child and your job is to unlock them. Teach them to know how to say yes and how to say no. It's very, very important to understand because our next generation don't really know when to say yes and when to, know, when to say no. And it's so vital that we build that at the early foundation. So the, the story in the Bible of Daniel, he was uh, sent with the whole of the people to ba Babylon, to the exile. And the king of Babylon was so smart, he took out all the smart kids from Israel and tried to change their mentality by teaching them their language and their culture and their philosophy. So they will become the people of the future leaders of the, of the country. And then Daniel was one of them. You know, they gave them drinks to drink it, you know, fit for the king. And Daniel decided in his heart that he's not going to defile himself with the liquor that is given by the king and all the food. He learned how to say no. Uh, Some time ago, I was uh, checking up, checking out in a, in a hotel in Paris. I arrived there on Thursday. I was due to talk on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday, I was due to talk on Tuesday the next, month, uh, the next week. But the reason I went there fast, because I hadn't prepared my talk. And the audience are all professors from everywhere in the, country, in the world. And I need to be good, see. So I got there. And when I check into the hotel, the two guys sitting standing there, they look at me. Number one, he is black. Number two, he dressed like a guy from the street because I had a t-shirt and jeans. And they look at each other and said, oh, you don't have any booking for you. And I said, well, of course I have bookings. Because the conference is held in the hotel. And they said, you know, we, we have a hotel there. We send you there. And they rang a taxi. I got into the taxi and went to this room. And I quickly turned up, put my computer and started work. And in front of me is a notice. The notice is that the room is about 2,000 something dollar a night. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not going to pay that. And anyway, I went to bed. And then all of a sudden, there's a knock in the room. And then the knock, there's only one knock, and then the room was open. This young, beautiful lady had the key to my room. And as she opened it, she spoke to me in French, about, you know, and held a little something in, his hand, in her hand. And then I said, I don't speak French, French, speaking English. And said, chocolate, chocolate, you want to eat chocolate? She hardly wore any clothes. <laughs> but she was asking if I would be eating chocolate. And, and then I went in the morning and complained, and I said, no, then he locked, closed the room. She closed the room and knocked on the next door. And then I went in the, in the morning and complained, why, why did this lady get a key to my room? And they told me that it's part of the service. You pay that much, and it comes with everything else. And I was thinking about my tolerant colleagues, especially the preachers. <laughs> Would they have the capability to say no? It's a good lesson to teach our kids from young age to know when to say no. It's very important, right? Secondly, dream out of a dignified heart. You see, my dad made a dream out of me. See, I grew up in the poverty. He talked to me a lot. We went fishing. We went, you know, I like following my dad and I learned everything from him. He was an awesome, awesome dad. He could hardly write his name. That's how much uh, education he said. But he said to me, you know, in the future, this, this country will be full of smart people. And you need to be one of them. 
He basically dreamed, this is what we do every day, you know, hot sun curing copper oil, working in the hot sun. Okay. If you want something bigger than that, you have to go to school. This is in the midst of me failing everything. You know, and, I, and, and that set on me, because reality is he in, in still dignity into my own life. And even though I failed, I was a good boy, because I wanted to please my dad in everything. He was not very healthy towards the end. From, <coughs> from 13 years old, I was the man of the house. I did the gardening, I did everything. And he was a proud man. But he instilled in me a strong sense of worth, a strong sense of belonging, a strong sense of security. And I grew with that. So basically, he made me have dreams of myself and believe my own dreams. And that's what you need to do. You do that. See, and I think you need to understand the background which kids come. If Pacific Island kids come to your home, understand what I'm talking about. They may come from a home that the father don't even understand dignity as we, as we know, as we talk about. So maybe he or she is taught to be quiet. But in the school, you are encouraged to talk. Your mark depends on how well you contribute to the discussion. Because talking back is disrespectful in, a, in my culture. But in school, you need to talk. So understand where they come from and help them to build, to, to see their potential. Help them to see that there can be many, many apples coming out of this seed. Help them to do that. And focus on building dignity, empowerment. See, be the difference in the kids' lives. See, in my whole entire journey, I can pick up a few people that made a lot of difference. My dad I spoke about, he's a teacher, Bill, you know, when I fell, you know, when I ran away from the other school to the good school, Bill was a science teacher and he taught me that I'm good. He said, that's very good. You see, some times ago, I, um, yeah, and there's Professor L at the university. She thought, you know, because when I talked to her, I made sense. When she reads my writing, it doesn't make sense. And she suspected that there is a slight possibility I might have a brain. <laughs> and she, she decided to work on that. And basically, she taught me how to write essays. I had to write a different paper, writing, writing, writing. And she pushed me, she pushed me to get A's. When I got to A's, I never got anything less than an A. And that's people that makes a difference in my own life. Excuse me. And um, I, 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 taught, I gave a lecture to a group of teachers in, in uh, Auckland who taught how to teach Pacific Islanders. And one of the points I said, they're going the extra mile. And the extra mile is basically sitting down and saying to, you, to, 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 to the child, how did you go on the last days? That's all. Because Pacific Islanders, they learn, they think with their minds, but learn with their hearts. They don't care to know unless they know you care. You know, it touched their heart. It's very easy for them to learn. And for me, all of a sudden I realized the teachers are on me. I have to perform, otherwise in trouble. So build relationships because the Pacific Islanders are more emotional than many other ethnic groups. It basically, you need to try and feel how they feel. Don't give up. Growth is probably deeper than you think. See, we go through obstacles. Life is full of obstacles, and my journey is so full of obstacles. When I uh, finished my master's, uh, I got told that my thesis is sent away for remarking because the head of school did not believe that I was that good because the mark was too good. I got the mark of A minus, and the head of school said, This guy is not that good. So he sent it to two other people, and one of them is the toughest marker that I know. He's a guy with a professor with beard, white beard, and all this. They both came back. One came back with an A with A plus, and one with an A, bigger than the first. So it's really good. But you see, you need to 
to overcome those and move on. Overcome the, the obstacle and move on. You know that, because our, our, your, your job can be really discouraging. See, you taught for this long, you don't really see change in the eyes of the children and all that. But let me remind you of the, of the Chinese bamboos. You know the Chinese bamboos? They grow it this year, and then we eat it, nothing happened. And then to do it the same, following year they water it and keep the weeds out and all this, nothing happened. Third year the same, fourth year, they start to grow. But when they grow, they grow everywhere. They grew it in here, but they grow up everywhere. What happened, there's a lot of growth, but it's happened underground. You don't want to see it. But when it happens, it will happen everywhere. So may I encourage you in your job, you may not see what has changed in the lives of the young people you work with, but I tell you, the growth is probably far more deeper than you know. And that's important. Finally, this is my last slide. You know, I would be lying if I don't tell you that the secrets of everything that I do is Jesus Christ. You know, when uh, Neil Armstrong was coming back from the, uh, capturing the moon, the moon, he was invited to speak in one of the um, universities in the U.S. And there were thousands of people gathered to listen to this hero who had got to this biggest achievement in the world the world has known. And as the people were quiet, he stood up and said, teachers and fellow students, the biggest event in history is not that man walked on the moon. The biggest event in history was when God himself walked on earth through Jesus Christ. He said, in my little life, I have seen a number of great things happening to me. I have uh, got my degrees. I have got a number of awards. I have uh, invented a number of patents. But the greatest event in my little life was none of this. The greatest event is when Jesus Christ came and took the wheel. And in my own journey, I sing this verse, Jesus, just take the wheel. I don't really know how to navigate myself through this life. But I know Jesus, the master, is the chain, and all the glory to be my Lord.